Arnold Toynbee was one of a series of uh, important scholars who tried to discover or examine the course of civilizations and of history in its, in its broadest possible sweep in the years directly following the First World War. Now, I want to briefly try to explain the significance of that historical context. Um, as late 20th century descendants of that epoch, we tend to think of the big one, the Great War, as the Second World War. Uh, and that often obscures for us the significance that the First World War had for Europeans and Westerners in general. Up to that point, as we'd seen in much historical speculation, there was a belief in unlimited progress. The worst period of European warfare, that of the religious wars of the 17th century, had come and gone. The Napoleonic Wars, which had uh, run across the European frontier, had been ended with the Congress of, of Europe, with the Concert of Vienna, with uh, a belief and a hope that war may have been transcended, at least in European civilization. While imperial wars persisted, wars in, the, in uh, Africa, in Asia, in the Crimea, for the most part, there were very few wars on the uh, European continental mainland. And those that did occur were relatively brief, uh, relatively bloodless affairs, the Austro-Prussian War, Franco-Prussian War. And there was a growing hope and belief that war had finally been ended as a major inter-European problem. That, in fact, um, future competition between nations would take the form of economic exchange, that a growing uh, internationalism and cosmopolitanism within the European order was at hand. And there was a belief that one could see quite clearly that progress in the last several hundred years of development. It was for that reason that the First World War devastated what Hegel might call the European spirit. It was an immense bloodletting. Uh, the millions who died there um, constituted an absolutely devastating effect on the populations of these societies. Uh, not to mention of which the incredible waste of resources um, and of land destroyed in the struggle. Add to that the particularly brutal form of the warfare, which in contrast to which the Second World War actually seems like quite a, a relief. Battles were always indecisive in the First World War. The trench warfare was the, perhaps the most psychologically and physically debilitating warfare imaginable. Chemical warfare was a, uh, a, a technique resorted to by both sides. And what had happened was the old tactics of uh, parry and maneuver had been bogged down by the development of weapons of mass destruction. So the First World War really represented more than just the bloodletting. It was as if Europe had opened its veins. And from it, the scholars who emerged from that struggle couldn't help but wonder what did this portend for the West, for the Western civilization. Might this not signal decline, if not disintegration, and end of all that had uh, transpired previously, all the great achievements of the West? Add to this the rather rapid emergence of Bolshevism in uh, what became the Soviet Union, fascism in Italy and Spain, and of course Nazism in Germany. And one can understand the ways in which various scholars searched the record of the past to see if this was a time of trouble from which the West might ever hope to recover. Several scholars engaged in this practice. One of the more famous ones is Oswald Spengler. But Perhaps the most famous, the most important, and certainly the most broad in his sweep and analysis was Arnold Toynbee. And like the other scholars, he was concerned to find if this cataclysmic struggle that had racked European culture might not have ended, or signaled at least, the end of Western civilization. Well, as I've mentioned, Toynbee's work is incredibly impressive in both scope and scale. I have read the abridged versions of the 12 or 10 volumes, which even in its abridgment is a massive tome with rather fine print. Um, and the wealth of information is absolutely astounding. Uh, 
Toynbee's analysis takes the form of a comparative study of civilizations across time and across space. And behind that, there is a fundamental assumption that civilizations are the proper units or subjects of historical analysis, not nations, not peoples, not races. And the reason he argues this is because he thinks there's a fundamental unity to a civilization, fundamental unity of its culture, of its institutions, of its mores, of its mentality. And it's for that reason he feels that cultures and forms of life uh, are unified within particular civilizations. It's an exhaustive study, and Toynbee identifies roughly 23 civilizations. I say roughly because the number is either 23 or 21, depending on whether you consider Russian Orthodox society a, a distinct but affiliated society to Greek Orthodox society, or whether you consider it um, part of the same uh, civilization. And the similar question has to be raised with Japanese civilization, whether it is in fact affiliated to the Cynic culture or whether it is in fact uh, a part of that Cynic culture. But we'll work with the number of roughly 23. The time span which in these, within which these civilizations uh, emerge, grow, and decline is roughly the last 6,000 years. Within that, many of these civilizations are affiliated to one another through various uh, techniques of affiliation and forms of affiliation that we'll discuss. But nonetheless, Toynbee is aware that given the broad natural history of the human species, 6,000 years is quite recent. The species has been around for quite some time. Uh, Neolithic man, which is to say village-oriented sedentary agriculture man, uh, is at least 50,000 years old. Um, or, excuse me, Paleolithic uh, man. A Neolithic man uh, certainly uh, predates civilization by quite some time. So civilizations are, in fact, in the lifespan of our species, a very recent development. And it, for that reason, Toynbee argued, they're a fruitful subject for comparative history. Because even in the span between, say, Sumer and modern Europe, they are, in the large scale of things, roughly contemporaries. So as rough contemporaries, um, they constitute a, a legitimate domain for um, comparative analysis. He also argues, uh, as we'll see towards the end, that there is another topic of analysis or subject of analysis beyond the civilization, which may in fact constitute an even higher form of human sociability. And that is the universal church or universal churches. And that possibly the highest form of human community that we can aspire to is an ecumenical brotherhood among the four great axial world religions, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Okay. Let's begin with the question of the genesis of civilizations. Roughly six civilizations emerged from what we might call the cake of custom. As we saw with Iliad, traditional Neolithic societies um, primitive societies tend to be preservative in their lifestyles. They tend to live extremely archetypal, ritual sorts of action in which very little changes. That cake of custom preserves the society intact without growth, without development, without any sort of internal transformation. Six, however, of these societies produced civilizations. And the mechanism that Toynbee thinks explains this change, this breakthrough, to history is, in fact, the mechanism of challenge and response. Which is to say, a society, a civilization, or a society, a community, a set of people are faced with some adversity, some challenge of some sort, in which the only response to that challenge that will be efficacious is civilization or a civilizing innovation. Now, there are several different sorts of challenges that can be faced. Uh, I want to begin first with physical challenges. This is most notably uh, faces the first hydraulic civilizations. Hydraulic civilizations are river valley civilizations whose uh, agriculture depends on massive irrigation works. The challenge facing such hydraulic civilizations, such as Mesopotamia, 
Egypt, the uh, ancient Cynic uh, civilization, Indus River Valley, Ganges River Valley, is the challenge of recuperating marshy swamp lands and dealing with the problem of regular flooding, which devastates the human communities, which would otherwise do quite well on the uh, rich land, the silt that accumulates from such flooding. The solution to this is the first form of hydraulic civilization, a hierarchical city-state run by priestly scholars who have developed the, right, the art of writing, of uh, astronomical observation, so that they can predict the time of flooding, supervise the construction of massive irrigation works, and be able to transfer information about when to flood dikes, where, up and down the river, uh, at the appropriate times, because they know when the seasons are coming and when the rains are to be expected. Same sort of physical challenge faces island peoples or seafaring peoples. We can think of the Polynesians or the Minoan civilization. The sea represents a great challenge, the solution of which is, of course, the development of ocean-going vessels, which facilitates the growth of trade. And finally, one of the third sorts of challenges that a civilization can face can come from blows, which is to say physical force exerted against a community, which forces it to respond, to come up with an innovation that allows them to meet the challenge of blows. And some examples might be um, the Hellenic Greeks emerge as a major civilization in response to the challenge of the Persian Empire at Marathon uh, and subsequently. And from that, they develop certain techniques. The phalanx as a military organization, which leads to a democratization of government. Um, certainly, we could think of, of several other examples of societies and civilizations who, when faced with blows, dangers of internal uh, conquest, developed large-scale responses which civilized them. Um, the Chinese civilization, when faced with the threat of nomadic uh, barbarians overrunning them, developed an extremely cohesive internal social structure and built the Great Wall of China, an example of response to a challenge. Finally, there is one last sort of challenge that can face a civilization, and that is penalties. When a particular group is faced with specific penalties focused on them uh, because of their membership in that group, they may well respond to that challenge with important innovations which lead to fundamentally their success in some ways. An example might be that the Roman slaves and freedmen who had been denied citizenship within the empire and state responded by embracing Christianity as a world religion which gave them some sense of membership. And very quickly, that institution and that faith came to conquer the empire of which they were members. They were remarkably successful in their endeavors. Uh, similarly, Christians in the Turkish empire were faced with civil disabilities, forced to pay higher taxes, uh, and banned from full citizenship. Very quickly, they responded through their merchant abilities and their uh, literary skills to quickly emerge as the best civil servants in the Ottoman Empire, being largely Christians, until eventually uh, Muslims demanded the right to be civil servants in their own culture. And of course, there is the example of Jews in the West, who when faced with penalties uh, throughout their history, have responded by creating strong community organizations, when banned from landowning, responded by engaging in trade with a vengeance, to the point where uh, the great banking house of Europe emerging in the uh, area of absolutism was that of the Rothschilds, a response to a challenge. Now, I should point out too much adversity, too strong of a challenge, can lead to stagnation. And perhaps the best example that Toynbee draws on is that of the Eskimos. The Eskimos face the most dramatic challenge faced by any group of humans on the planet. It is the most inhospitable environment imaginable. And they've succeeded admirably in responding to that challenge and eking out a livelihood in uh, at frozen wasteland. But the result is it was such a severe challenge that all of the resources must be deployed simply to maintain survival. So very quickly, that society uh, stagnated and was unable to develop. So what is really needed for a civilization to develop is a golden mean, a challenge which is not too light, too easy. And the example here might be tropical peoples 
who live in such an abundance of food and livelihood that there's no reason for them to develop civilization. They're in almost a paradisal state. And on the other hand, the Eskimo, whose challenge is so great that his response leaves him in a stagnant society. Every successful response always evokes another challenge. And every time a challenge is successfully responded to, the society or civilization that is engaged in that challenge builds an elan in self-confidence, which carries it forward to the next challenge. And, and Toynbee's analogy is that of a mountain climber who climbs the mountain. And every time he gets up to another peak, he gains more confidence in his ability to climb. Okay. Now, We've seen how civilizations begin. Let's discuss the growth of civilizations. We begin with Toynbee's notion of what a society is. A society is not an organic unity, as uh, Hegel had argued, but rather it's simply a structure or a system of relations that exist between individuals. It's not a supernatural entity. It's not some organic phenomena. It's a straightforward set of relations between persons. Within any society, all of the growth, all of the successful responses to challenges come from not some world spirit or the spirit of the people, but from individuals. And usually from creative individuals, a handful. And the mechanism they use is what he calls uh, withdrawal and return. Such individuals withdraw from the society temporarily, either psychologically or physically. And generally, they withdraw in the, for the goal of personal enlightenment, to solve some sort of spiritual ruddle, uh, riddle that had faced them, or some philosophical riddle that had, pro that had troubled them. They achieve the enlightenment, and then they return to the society to convert the rest of the society to the innovation they've achieved. And clearly, in, in the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, this is exemplified in the lives of the prophets, all of whom go into a retreat into the mountains or into the desert for some time, have some powerful conversion experience, confront God perhaps in some way, and then return to dispense the message to the people. This conversion is achieved for the most part by what Toynbee called mimesis, or drill. In other words, very few people are capable of sustaining the same enlightenment of that creative individual. But what they are capable of doing is being taught ritually to imitate certain acts by drill. And as long as those acts prove efficacious in some way, they will engage in that drill. As a society grows, as it evolves, it is accompanied by a further social differentiation within the society. And the different elements of the society that emerge in the social differentiation achieve differing degrees of mimesis or conversion to the teaching of the creative individuals. Okay, that's, that's the causes of the growth of civilizations. Now, as for the breakdown of civilizations, begin with this. Most civilizations are dead. Of the 23 civilizations that he identifies, most of them have come and gone and no longer exist. And of the few, the handful that remain, all but one have already broken down. And the only one that Toynbee thinks has not clearly broken down is that of the West. And what causes a breakdown of civilization? Well, first, a transformation among those creative individuals. Those creative individuals constitute within the society a creative minority. At some point, it may happen that that creative minority ceases to be creative and degenerates into what we might call a dominant minority. So consider the Christian monks. At one point, they were a creative minority. They removed themselves, withdrew from their society, and returned with mystical teachings and insights into the nature of, of communion with God. Over time, however, they degenerated into a simply dominant minority in the sense that they became rested on the laurels of their past achievements and became large-scale landowners who uh, became rentiers to serfs and peasants, exacting dues, alms, and tithes. 
So that's, that's the first part. The dominant minority uh, emerges from the previously creative minority. The second element of a breakdown is when the majority of the society withdraws its allegiance from the dominant minority and from the society itself. And with that, they withdraw their mimesis. They withdraw their imitation. They cease to engage in the ritual patterns that have been drilled into them by what were once creative minorities and are now, now merely dominant. And this, of course, leads to the third element, a decline of social unity. No longer is there a sense of a common project shared by all members of the society. Increasingly, the social differentiation corresponds with and is accompanied by a sense of particularity, of particular allegiances, in which the Roman plebeian no longer feels himself a Roman, but simply a plebeian. Where the noble, the Roman patrician, no longer thinks of himself as first and foremost a Roman, but thinks of himself primarily as a large holder of latifundia, of huge estates, who may share interests with the large-scale owners of other civilizations, of perhaps a Persian civilization. Now, what causes these minorities, creative minorities, to become merely dominant? Well, one thing may be that they, in fact, might become infected with the mechanicalness of their followers. That means that this mimesis or drill is literally a mechanical ritual. Think of almost any religious ritual as liturgical in nature, and you'll see it's actually a very mechanical sort of process. You say given words, which are written down and learned by rote, over and over and over again. You do certain acts, kneeling at the correct time, taking certain, uh, perhaps, uh, rites of communion at the correct time in the correct way. And this can become, in, this can infect the creative minority itself, where it begin, begun, begins to become purely mechanical. Another thing that can happen to the creative minority is that it can begin to fetishistically preserve outdated institutions or techniques. It can fail to see that the old techniques that had developed in the old institutions were means to an end, were uh, techniques or strategies of bringing out a particular sort of result. And instead, in an antiquarian fashion, they become obsessively valued simply because they are old, and they become then fetishes. When that happens, that minority has ceased to be creative and is now simply dominant. Well, certainly, militarism never helps. As a dominant minority becomes more and more militaristic, it ceases to be innovative and becomes increasingly conservative. The only thing that can make that worse is victory. The more victories won by, it, by a militaristic dominant minority, the more conservative it becomes. An excellent example is Sparta, who achieved a fantastic success with its militaristic organization of society and very quickly developed an incredibly static social order without any dynamism, without any change. And in a sense, Sparta atrophied as a result of its success rather than its failures. But some of there's another reason to suspect that dominant minorities uh, or creative minorities will always become dominant, simply because it's rather rare and hard to, to expect any minority to continue to keep responding to challenges in, in creative ways. We would expect, as new challenges emerge, different minorities to emerge to respond to those challenges. But once the minority which has brought this creativity established itself as a, a powerful group, it may generally refuse to acknowledge the existence of other creative minorities. Uh, one example off the top of my head, we might well think of the um, execution or sentencing of Socrates as a result of an old dominant minority refusing to acknowledge the emergence of a new creative minority, the philosophic circle of the Socratics and their teaching. Well, when that happens, when we've achieved this sort of, begun this process of breakdown, and the minorities have, be the minority, the leading edge of the society has become merely dominant and exploitive and oppressive. The followers of that previously creative group become disaffected. And Toynbee calls such a group a proletariat. They have, in spirit at least, in their loyalties, seceded from their civilization. Well, following a breakdown comes the process of 
disintegration. In disintegration, a society is split into three crucial elements. First, as we mentioned, a dominant minority. Secondly, an internal proletariat, a disaffected community, a disaffected majority who no longer are willing to follow the drill and mimesis of that minority. And then finally, and perhaps in some cases most importantly of all, an external pr proletariat, which is to say barbarians who live at the border of the civilization, who as long as the minority was creative, engaged in mimesis themselves, retained perhaps trading rights, retained the desire to perhaps become part of this civilization. Once that minority becomes exclusively dominant, they will come to hate that civilization. Now, each of these groups produces different institutions and, and responds to uh, breakdown in the process of disintegration in different ways. The dominant minority responds to uh, breakdowns by rallying around universal states. They create a new sense of order by enlarging the domain of government and creating huge empires. And we can think of several such examples. Uh, the Mauryan Empire in, in India, um, the Han Empire in China, the Roman Empire over the Hellenic world, the Alexandrian Empire over the Hellenic world, um, the Persian Empire, uh, and on and on. The internal proletariat that has seceded in spirit from the civilization, it produces, during periods of disintegration, universal churches. The internal proletariat of the Roman Empire produced Christianity. Um, the internal proletariat of uh, the, or actually uh, in the barbarian fringe of the Persian Empire produced Islam uh, and the internal proletariat, or so he would argue, of, uh, of India produced both, to some extent, Hinduism in, in its final synthesis and Buddhism. And finally, the external proletariat, once they have become disaffected with the civilization, no longer want to learn to imitate it uh, and become part of it, they become barbarian war bands. And we can think of the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths and the Mongols, on and on. Now, the only way to avoid this integration, once it has begun, is through what uh, Toynbee calls petrification. A society can literally petrify, stop its development, and become stuck in a particular moment for an extended period. And perhaps the classic example of this is Egypt. After Egypt is overrun by the Hyksos, in the Middle Kingdom, henceforth, Egyptian society will become incredibly conservative, retaining its most primitive early beliefs when the challenge of a creative minority tries to bring to it monotheism under the Pharaoh Akhenaton it is very quickly dismissed and a return to the traditional priestly religion um, of polytheism is, uh, is resumed with a fervor that is uh, inexplicable and, and incomparable. And as a result, uh, ancient Egypt lasted for a profoundly long time, longer than any other civilization, but in a petrified state. It never developed and it became static. During periods of disintegration is when we see a proliferation of a wide variety of alternative lifestyles. As our civilization disintegrates, we will find things like people dropping out, engaging in hermeticism, uh, engaging in dissolution, it is at that moment when we find the emergence of decadent lifestyles among the, the, the rich, um, debauchery, asceticism, and of course, martyrdom. So the responses on the part of individual lifestyles to these sort of psychosocial pressures of disintegration range from decadent abandon, the sort of thing we find in a Caligula or a Nero or a Commodus, uh, all the way over to martyrdom of people like St. Sebastian or St. Stephen. Such disintegration always follows uh, what Toynbee calls a time of troubles. And the only way to put off such disintegration is through rallies, temporary responses to that challenge, which are never ultimately su successful, the most famous of which is the universal state, which we will get into in a minute. 
it's a peculiar fact that Toynbee's own analysis uh, argues that there is a fundamental rhythm to the development of societies uh, w once they've begun to break down. And it takes hundreds of years, the breakdown period and disintegration, hundreds of years. And he argues that the rhythm is something like this, challenge, crisis, followed by a brief rally, followed by another crisis, followed by a brief rally. And he argues that in, in most of the civilizations, there's in fact a three and a half beat rhythm. Crisis, rally, crisis, rally, crisis, rally, crisis, it's gone. Okay, now as I mentioned, one of the uh, rally points that holds together a civilization on the, er on the verge of disintegrating is the creation of universal states. They are a response to the challenge or rout of a time of troubles. Now, what is a time of troubles? A time of troubles is usually the beginning of an internal fissure within the civilization. Generally, in military terms, this takes the form of a civil war within the civilization. So let us think of examples. The Peloponnesian War between Athens and Greece and between their two leagues uh, or alliances serves as a civil war within the Greek civilization. The response to it, as they let blood across Greece, is the creation of a universal state, the Macedonian Empire, uh, that first is begun by Philip of Macedon and then uh, extended by his son, Alexander the Great. Another example, the Roman Civil Wars. Intermittent fighting between various uh, noble families, patrician families, the struggle of the Gracchi on behalf of the, plebe the plebeians results in, finally, after immense bloodletting, creation of a universal state, the Roman Empire, under the Caesars. Um, similarly, the uh, Mauryan Empire of uh, the subcontinent of Asia in India emerges after a time of troubles and civil wars between the Rajas, in which uh, the, the tenuous hold of the Ganja civilization on, on, on its own uh, uplift and maintenance is secured by the establishment of one large empire. A similar process happens in China as well. Now, we should point out universal states are in a sense tragic. They always ultimately fail in their purported task of ending the time of troubles, of bringing a universal peace. The Roman Empire ultimately does fall. The Mauryan Empire ultimately does fall. None of them can ultimately be sustained forever. But they do serve another purpose. They create institutional arrangements which facilitate the growth of, higher re of the higher religions of the internal proletariats. Now, what are some of these institutions? Well, roads. The ex vast expanse of roads the Romans built facilitated Paul's journeys throughout the Roman Empire and his proselytization and spreading of the Christian faith. Similarly, the facilitation of the birth of great means of, of transportation and of communication, regular mails, means that it's easier to communicate the ideas of a universal church religion, of a religion which membership is a matter of faith. Uh, the development of a lingua franca, of one common tongue within the empire, means that people of different ethnicities and different uh, backgrounds can communicate in a shared language. Latin uh, gave just that to the Roman Empire, Greece to the Alexandrian Empire. Okay, that brings us to the topic of universal churches. These have two functions. First of all, they serve as what he calls chrysalises, or bridges between affiliated civilizations. For example, Christianity preserved what elements were left of the disintegrating Roman Empire and Hellenic civilization and then re, re, um, maintain that legacy to hand it over to the emerging Western civilization that would come out of it. So universal churches always do preserve elements of previous uh, civilizations for the later affiliated or child civilization. Hinduism serves the exact same function um, as Indian civilization goes through uh, a Mauryan stage and then emerges later in the rule of the Guptas. In fact, however, universal churches also have a higher function. Universal churches constitute a species of society. 
a system of relations among individuals. And they are a higher uh, order of society than that found in civilization. In a universal church, the principle of membership is purely spiritual, which means that membership within it is purely voluntary. So you have a system of human relations and sociability which is based on consent and on uh, a voluntary submission. And all are devoted to uh, the one true God, whether that be called Allah, Jehovah, Jesus, uh, the Bodhisattva, or um, Vishnu. Now, there are certain dangers that face any universal church, uh, the greatest of which is ecclesiastical militancy. And that can lead to the breakaway of affiliated civilizations. It was the ecclesiastical militancy of the Catholic Church that produced, in part, Protestantism. Um, and similarly, it was the ecclesiastical militancy of all Christian churches that produced the modern Western secular society. It was precisely the fact that the church carried the sword which led people to flee the church. Okay, I want to turn to heroic ages. Heroic ages always begin with a frontier between a universal state like the Roman Empire and barbarians at the French. The barbarians no longer want to participate in that civilization because the minorities become exclusively dominant. But what they must do, and what they always do, however, is learn from the dominant minority on the frontier. They learn their military techniques, their strategies, their technologies. And it will not be long before they learn to triumph over those civilizations and overrun them. The result is, in a sense, tragic. Once they conquer, what do they do with what they've conquered? They have no ability to maintain it. And the result is they always usher, usher in a dark age, a period of barbarism. And yet, at the same time, there are certain boons that come from such uh, heroic ages. They produce fantastic works of literature. The great epics all come from barbarian ages. Homer's Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, the Mahabharata, um, the great chivalric epics all come from these heroic ages. And once these ages end, there are no more epics written. I mean, unless you want to consider comic books and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. You cannot have an epic without the barbarian uh, heroic age. Also, they link civilizations of the first two uh, generations. Right? It's the barbarian uh, Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Franks who link, to some, in some sense, uh, Hellenic civilization with Western Christendom. Okay, I want to now examine contacts between civilizations in space. And here Toynbee is concerned primarily with the contacts between modern Western civilization and that of all of its contemporaries. Now, he notes that the Western civilization is fundamentally a middle-class civilization. That's its most creative minority. The small entrepreneur, businessman, professional. That's its model. That's its most creative element. And whenever Western civilization comes in contact with another civilization with a middle class, that middle class and that civilization welcomes it, is glad to see it. Because that middle class means that it will be able to assimilate the mores of the West and compete with it successfully. The others, if they have any desire to compete with the West, which they must, because the West is the most powerful, need to train an artificial middle class. And that is what Toynbee calls an intelligentsia. So that intelligentsia, professional educated group, is trained to assimilate the mores of that civilization, of the Western civilization. And we can think of scientists and uh, engineers. And of course, we know what happens. They always turn against their masters. It's precisely those educated elites in the third world that produce nationalist revolutions against the West. Right? People like uh, Lenin, who is, in fact, had a PhD in law. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, who had studied in Paris. Che Guevara, who was a doctor. Fidel Castro, the son of a wealthy planter. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now let me turn to contacts between civilizations and time. 
Toynbee details the history of renaissances in world history. And that's what we mean by con contacts and civilizations between time. The attempt to rebirth, to, to have a rebirth or reemergence of some previously dead civilization. Some of these are launched by dy dynastic rulers. An excellent example of which is the Carolingian Renaissance under Charlemagne at his court. They're never successful when they're launched by dynastic rulers because a civilization must evolve to a certain and develop to a certain level before it can, quote, summon the ghost of, of a past civilization. So the Carolingian Renaissance was abortive. It only succeeded at the time of Petrarch. Now, I want to uh, engage the question of law and freedom in history, according to Toynbee. Toynbee takes, in many ways, a very naturalistic interpretation of law. He rejects the Hegelian view that there is no mechanical law-like nature to human behavior in human history. And he rejects it on the most intuitive and obvious grounds. If there is no law-like behavior, then tell me, what do actuaries in an insurance company do? What do um, economists who study the business cycle do? Um, what do military historians who study war and peace cycles do? Certainly, there are law-like behaviors. That's why different people have different insurance rates on their automobiles. Obviously, is law-like behavior among men. Even major mental and cultural changes within a society take place over a specified interval. And Toynbee finds that this always follows a three-generation cycle. Now, the reason he thinks that it always takes this three-generation cycle probably comes from what he considers the depth psychology of the unconscious, which was being developed at the time by people like C.G. Jung, that it takes a certain amount of distance from the patriarch to uh, make a fundamental break. Now, this turns to some of our concluding topics here. One is the prospects of the Western civilization, civilization within which we live and within, within which he lived. And he's quite frank about why he wrote the book. After the First World War, he couldn't help but be struck by its similarity to the Peloponnesian War. That Athens versus Greece, uh, Athens versus Sparta was very similar to Germany versus England and France. And he was afraid that that was the time of trouble which signaled the end of the West. Nonetheless, it had clearly not begun to disintegrate yet. There had not been the massive disaffection at the point. So it's not certain yet that the West must decline, nor must the West follow the patterns of previous civilizations. We can learn from them. Nonetheless, there are certain problems that face the West. Militarism and war has yet to be solved in the West. And the First World War proved that, and that was a prophetic comment given the fact of the oncoming of the Second World War. Nonetheless, the West has made great strides, great responses to challenges in certain directions. Technologically, we are the most sophisticated civilization the world has ever seen, and our dynamism technologically is overwhelming. Similarly, Abolition, the abolition of slavery in the 19th century throughout the New World controlled by Europeans. Toynbee considers one of the most remarkable breakthroughs in human history, one of a sign that the West was still creative, still held, held potentials. Women's rights, something which existed nowhere else in the world and still is, has a very tenuous hold on other parts of the world, considers again an extension, a sign of the vitality of the West, that it can embolden and empower members of of the human community that had never been given any due previously. Democracy and the spread of uh, mass institutions of education. He discusses the possibility of a future world order, which would be on the order of a United Nations where the United Nations would have the power of sovereignty. He also suggests it along another line, a universal state, which would have to be led by the Americans. And Toynbee, as an Englishman, is quite fair about the Americans. He notes they're extremely violent, they're extremely militaristic and crude and bumptious, as every European likes to point out. But he also notes they're the most magnanimous people. They're the most universal in their morality. Um, and they are also uh, the most likely of any people to live up to their ideals. They show the greatest amount of disinterested in, disinterestedness in foreign policy. And this may be a fact that the Americans bailed the English out of the First World War, um, but it may also be actually a fairly fraud, broad and fair uh, long-range view of America relative to all the other nations. Now, it is not, uh, Toynbee is aware that a new world order, as it were, which might even solve the problem of war, should not be seen as a, as a, as a sort of utopian panacea. 
there are still dangers that face us. One would be the mechanization of life. In order to achieve greater wealth and prosperity for all members of society, to do away with the discontent of our internal proletariat, whether that be an underclass or a working class, the only way we're going to achieve that is through greater division of labor, autom automation, and technological innovation, which would lead to a me uh, mechaniz mechanization of life. The sort of danger that uh, Huxley tried to warn us about in Brave New World. It might also lead to a decline of liberty and a, st a stagnation which would be necessary to ensure social justice. In order to uh, achieve true fairness in society, you would have to do away with a certain amount of freedom, which produces inequality. And with that inequality came dynamism. Even if we could achieve this, however, it would not ensure our happiness.